the scenes on this one. We can go in this one. So watch your step as you're coming in. Go ahead and filter around here. We're actually going to go inside this one. Oh. So go ahead and stand here, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this building. This has a lot of history to it, a lot more exact, too. So go ahead and filter over here. You have everybody a lot of room. So go ahead, and if you could filter over here. We're going to go in both rooms. We're going to start with this one. I'm going to trap you here inside the museum. Okay. <laughs> so this, this building, and now, as I said, a lot of the buildings that you're seeing were built by the soldiers that used to be part of the Spanish realm. Now they're Mexican soldiers. So this was built by a uh, soldier by the name of Machado. It's called the Machado Stewart Building. I think later on one of his daughters married one of these guys from Boston. That's why they got the name on it. But this would be occupied from the 1830s as a home all the way to the 1960s. So for 140 years, there was family that lived here. And one of the descendants lived here. And then when the Parks Department took it over, they said, well, you can't run it anymore. It's part of our museum piece. So they eventually had to get her out. But if you look around, you'll see things that are a bit more precise. And I'm going to start with the ceiling. So you see this stuff that looks like bamboo up there. That's called Carrizo cane. And it grows, uh, when the Spanish started exploring, they went to the Azores and the Canaries, they found this stuff and it proved to be great building material. I mean, like I said, like bamboo in the uh, Southeast Asia. So they would use it for the roofing. They'd put it together, you know, and they'd have to get some lumber. And then they'd put it on top of it. And of course, on top of that, on the other side, you've got some sort of clay or some sort of uh, mud. And then on top of that, you'd put your uh, tile. And remember, they're going to cannibalize and take a lot of pieces and things off the Presidio and the Mission and bring it here as well. But that's more precise. And this stuff grows wild all over the place. You go between Texas and Mexico, you'll see tons of it just growing wild. Even the local riverbed, the San Diego riverbed, you'll see lots of this Carrizo cane just growing all over the place. But when you look at the home, it gives you an idea of how they live. You've got your porcelain brought in from Asia. You know. I, for the Asian trade, the Spanish used to have these manila galleons that would come from the Philippines, sail to the California coast, and eventually go down to Acapulco. So this was one of their stops. So they pick up the uh, porcelain. Obviously, you had the tallow they, they could make into ca uh, candles from the cows. The whaling ships that would stop by, I'm sure you could figure what this one is, used to be a harpoon. And so a lot of times they'd trade with these guys, say, hey, can I you know, trade with you? And then they would make something uh, from it, maybe some sort of farm equipment. So that was fairly consistent. And of course, if you look at how they would build the, the uh, shelving in here, and of course, the earth, earthquake shelving I like over here. When there's an earthquake, you'd imagine things stabilize a little bit better. But what they ate, you know, like I said, the chilies and the different vegetables, uh, a lot of it was homegrown. Didn't do a lot of cooking in here, except for maybe when the weather was bad outside. So that wasn't so common, but occasionally you had to. And of course, here, the all-valuable cow hide. Back in the day, they used to call these California banknotes, because that's how they traded. This was worth some money. Not as much money as those sea otter pelts, but still, you could get you know two or three dollars worth of trade goods from these ships that were cruising in here. But very self-sufficient. Maybe they are one of the younger kids here, making your own clothing with a spinning wheel. And then, like I said, let me show you the, the other room here. Come on in. Ayana, did you see the size of the bed? Uh, <laughs> yeah, if you get a chance, too, on the other side of Old Town, going to the south side, there's a cemetery over there past the Whaley House. Everybody comes here to look for ghosts. Past the Whaley House, there's actually a cemetery there, and you'll see Estudios and Machados, people that were descendants that you know live here. So this was the mom and uh, dad's room, and the daughters as well. They would sleep in the same room. So this was the bed that the uh, father and mother would sleep in. And you'll notice, before Serta and all these fancy mattresses that we enjoy today, it was a rope bed. And so you'll see this, and on the other side, there's a knot that you'd cinch in to tighten it up. And you probably heard the expression, sleep tight. Uh -huh. That's where that comes oh. from. Sleep tight is pulling that rope. Make sure it's nice and taut. That way you get a firm sleep. So this was mom and dad's room. Now, everybody asked me, well, where's the boys? If the girls are here in the trundle bed, and you got someone out there, maybe a younger boy, where's, every, where's all the older boys? They're working the ranch. 
they're out there, they're working with the cattle, they're working far out there in the East County somewhere. Because a lot of these guys, when they were allocated lands, which became towns that we know, like where I live in El Cajon, that's ranch land back then. And thousands and thousands of cattle roaming free, eating all that grass. So the girls would sleep here, same rope, rope bed. Uh, I mentioned too that these guys were all soldiers, but here's something really interesting, is their armor. Everybody thinks of the Spanish wearing these heavy armor and so on, but they learned something from the Aztecs. When they were fighting the Aztecs back in the days of Cortez in the 1520s, the Aztecs were wearing this leather type of armor. And so the Spaniards are going, okay, it's kind of easier maneuver, a little bit lighter than this uh, heavy metal that we're wearing. So they, and I'll let you hold that, they actually started making this out of double leather. And it's a little heavy, but it actually could stop an arrow couldn't stop a lance, but that was a little bit more manageable. So these, these soldiers were known as leatherback soldiers. That was their little nickname that they had. But you got to realize the California Indians, they were kind of docile, but there were a few uprisings. And so sometimes there were attack on some of the soldiers during the Mexican period. They'd have to go in the East County and there was some, you know, warring going on, but occasionally they'd have to wear that to defend themselves against attack. So yeah, leatherback soldiers back in the day little armor from that time frame. Now, one other thing in here was one of the chores of the youngest kids. You'll notice in the, the corner over here is the commode or the chamber pot. Usually somewhere in the morning after breakfast, everybody had their meal, then maybe the youngest, sorry. I know. <laughs> so one of the youngest had to go out there and find a place to dump that in the chamber pot, but that was fairly common as well. But it, this building would be here for so long, and like I said, lived in all the way to the 1960s, all right? Now I'm going to take you out to the garden area. I'm going to show you the oven out there as well as some of the foods and a very important cactus that was grown back then. Still is. Okay? So we could head out. Is the furniture original? No, the, the furniture. Latin America. I have a lot of tourists that visit from Mexico, parts of, uh, I have some people from Argentina that here the other day. This is called an horno. And an orno is where they did a lot of their outdoor cooking. So you figure one thing about these people, especially the Californians and the Spanish, they ate a lot of meat. Meat in the morning, meat in the lunch, meat in the afternoon. And beef tongue was one of the more popular dishes. But what they would do is they'd make an adobe oven fuel to get the fire going. Anybody want to guess what that was? Remember, there's no wood. Cow poop. Cow poop, exactly. Just like the pioneers when they got buffalo chips on the way to the Oregon Trail. Same kind of thing. So one of the younger kids, maybe the dad would say, hey, go get some you know, cow poo out there, dried ones per 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 place. Bring them in here, stock it full, light it up, get it nice and hot where the adobe is gonna absorb that heat. And eventually you take some device and get some of the ashes out of there, spread it around, and then you're gonna put your meat in there. And I heard back in the day, you could cook a turkey in about half the time, about two and a half to three hours, and it would keep the juices inside the meat. And of course today, People use these for pizza ovens. You see a lot of that around here, but we have a lot of visitors from Latin America and they're still using these. It's the only way to cook, it's the best way to cook. Mm -hmm. But that was common, and you'll see another one later on. All right, cactus time. Gotta welcome yourself to the Southwest and see, you'll see a lot of these prickly pear or beaver tail cactus. Now, very valuable plant because it has a lot of uses to it. So you don't have wood to make fencing. What do you use? Cactus. So if you went to the East County, you'll see rows of this stuff. Say, so, wow, what's with that? Well, it keep the cattle in or it would keep the cattle from coming into your homes and eating your beautiful garden out here. But that's not all. There's also a food item that you can make out of it. It's called nopales. Nopales, what they do is they take a stalk about that big, take the thorns off, steam it up, cut it up and put it in your salsa. It's like a, a same texture as a, like cucumber, for example. But nopales is very popular in Latin America today. So that's two. But the most important thing is what grows on it. Let me take a few pieces over here. This is called cochinilla. It's a bug that grows in the cactus. And it, you know, when you squish it up, it turns into this red. Well, what they did back in the later Spanish period and during the Mexican period, they used it for dyes. You've heard of like indigo, like blue indigo? Well, mm -hmm. this was a type of dye that proved to be very profitable for the Mexican government. So silver was their number one income. Second was cochineal. 
And when, again, a lot of countries bought this stuff and they can make a dye out of it for, you know, clothing. All right? So let's just take a quick gander at the gardens here. Things are growing real well here. Wow. Looking good. Mm -hmm. The gardeners have done well. So you're going to be self-sufficient. So you're going to have the different spices. You're going to have the different herbs for, like, tummy aches. And, you know, you're, you're far from any doctor. So you're going to have to be self-sufficient. So they'd have their onions, they have their tomatoes, they have all sorts of, uh, like I said, garlic growing here. But this is typical, and right now it's at its prime, right, right here now. But you're definitely going to have a lot of herbs. A lot of herbs. So this is a typical garden back then. Very old, but very important, you think about it. You see all that white stuff growing on there. But you'd have to gather up a lot of that stuff to make make it worth your while. But yeah. Eat, 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 eat